Hey folks, welcome to the first ever Monday Morning Haskell video blog post. Um, basically, instead of doing uh, sort of written content like I have been doing um, all the time, combined with like GitHub code examples, uh, I'm just gonna sort of do some li live coding, live exercises, um, and just to sort of demonstrate how things work. I think I'm gonna try this uh, format for uh, at least a few weeks and see how things work out. Um, uh, to start uh, this week, we're going to be, um, since we've been going through uh, Rust and some more advanced concepts in Rust for the last um, for the last couple of months, really, um, I thought it'd be interesting uh, to uh, go over this, uh, this framework called Rustlings, or this sort of, um, I'm not sure whether they call it a framework, it's almost like a game, where uh, or it's a teaching material, basically, to help teach you the basics uh, of the Rust language. And I, I think in addition, you know, if you um, still haven't like really learned the basics of Rust and you're curious about that, um, this, is, uh, this is a cool tool to use. And so you can maybe learn something from uh, watching this video and watching how the tool works. Um, I think I'll probably do some of the more basic concepts in this video to just um, demonstrate how, um, how it works. And then uh, in another video next week, I'll go into more some of the more advanced um, Rust concepts, and I'm also very interested in this application because I'd, I'd be, um, I think it'd be very cool to write something similar for um, Haskell, uh, you know, sort of a Haskellings uh, program, as it were. Um, so we can, you know, use this to help teach people about Haskell, you know, this other uh, functional language, obviously, that, you know, I am very much a fan of. Um, so let's jump into it. Uh, we have to clone a GitHub repository. Or, or, I mean, it's doing more than cloning. It's also uh, just checking some of our uh, uh, dependencies that we have Rust and Cargo installed. Um, you can watch our Rust um, you know, video tutorial to learn a little more about the basics of Cargo uh, and everything. But now it's compiling um, the project um, just so we can get everything to work. And the way this tool is structured is that there are a series of exercises. And uh, we should be able to go into that on the screen now. We should be able to for exercises directory and we have all these different topics that we'll learn about um, in Rust um, that will just teach us the language basics um, so where we'll end up starting actually is variables um, so if we go to variables 1 um, you'll see that the, the goal on a lot of these basic um, exercises is that um, we want to make just make this code compile and learn something about um, the Rust language along the way. Um, so what we'll do is we'll go into the Rustlings directory here, and we'll use the command Rustlings Watch. Um, I spelled it. Um, so what this is actually going to do is um, basically watch all of the different files, like like um, so that when we change the files, like our program will update, and it'll tell us what our um, compiler errors are. Um, so what we see right now is that this program we have on the right side of our screen actually has a compiler error. It turns out that in Rust, um, when you declare a variable, you need to use the word let. Um, so um, once we do that, uh, we should, uh, on the left side, it will say it can now successfully run this exercise. Um, so uh, we can go ahead and remove this line, the I'm not done line. Uh, and it'll move us on uh, to the next exercise. So let's just uh, keep doing some of these to learn more about uh, Rust variables and some of these basic things. So um, do variables two. And uh, so just one example where it says uh, we'll put a type annotation for our variable. Um, but this is also not the only thing we need to do here uh, since we're also making a comparison uh, with this variable that we just declared, it it's invalid to do this um, basically uh, without initializing the variable first. We can't use it in comparison. And Rust is it's cool that I can catch this at compile time, like um, C++. Uh, there there are some tools in C++ that will um, catch this by compile time, but I think those are optional. Um, but now we'll see that our code uh, really ought to compile. Um, we can also see the program output here. It's ten. Um, if we change it uh, to something like 9, um, then it'll say not 10. Use the other output. 
Um, assuming that it's still watching. Sometimes it doesn't. There it is. Okay. Sometimes you have to uh, go over there just to uh, double check. Um, but yeah, and once again, move on. Um, on to exercise three. Um, so yeah, just to learn a little bit about Rust, we're going to keep uh, going through these exercises. Um, this one, um, three, uh, our variable is mutable. Uh, so we need to add the, you know, the mute keyword, or M-U-T, mut, if you, if you like. Um, and this allows us to sort of change the value of our variable, which can't, we can't normally do. Um, So the next one variables four. Um, this one's a little more. Uh, we want to again. We can't print a number if we haven't initialized it. So, so ten. Nothing uh, too complicated here. All right, variables five. So here we're sort of changing. Um, well, in the first place, we are we, we are changing number to effectively have a different type. We can't do that in Rust, even if we were to make this mutable. Um, it says don't change this line, but you do. I think for this, you have to make it mutable. Uh, but you can't change a string to an integer. You have to um, keep. Yeah, you, you have to maintain the same type for uh, all of your different expressions. Um, so you can change it uh, like so. Uh, we can also do constants, six. Uh, constants, we have to assign a explicit type. Yeah, just uh, let those be inferred uh, in Rust. So go with that. And all right, so we're done with now all of the uh, variables uh, categories. We move on to the ifs. Uh, so there are only two of these. Um, it's got some tests that are running down here. Kind of neat. Um, but it says complete this function to return the bigger number. Do not use another function call. Do not use initial uh, additional variables. Um, so you can also ask for hints is a neat little. This looks like it's just sort of a waiting term. We can type the word hint, and it can uh, do all kinds of. Uh, It'll, it'll give us some helpful information. Um, is it possible to do this on one line? I like, which I don't actually know. It's interesting. Um, I wonder if I can do this. If A or B. That works. Expected one of. Or maybe I need to put A. Is very curious. I'm like sort of sort of stretching the bounds of uh, what the Rust syntax tricks I know. Of course, the, the, the easy way to do this is just to say, um, you know, if oops, you know, a greater than b. That that's the sort of easy way to do it. I'm not sure how um, you can necessarily one line. I suppose you could probably do that. That would probably work. Yeah, that works. I mean, I'm definitely more of a multi-line if statement person. Uh, most of your if statements won't be uh, quite so obviously simple. Um, but yeah, that's sort of one of the most basic way to do if statements uh, in Rust. Um, so now let's look at two. So we want to first make this compile, um, get the bar for fuzz and default to baz. Interesting. Okay, so this always returns a string. So the first problem we'll notice in this is that um, the two branches of your if statements have to return the same type. Uh, so we have, you know, this one returns a string, this one returns an int. That's not very good. Um, our type signature overall uh, returns a string, so both of our branches should return a string. Um, and we're trying to make these tests pass. So if we pass uh, fizz, it should return a foo. Um, if we pass a fuzz, it should return bar. Literally anything else should be baz. 
default to baz. R for fuzz. Okay, so if the input is fizz, then we return foo. Else if. So I'm going to say that if it's fuzz, then we want to return bar else baz. Let's see if that works. There, that works. Okay, cool. All right, now we can uh, sort of get out of our if statements, and we'll go into functions. And these are five functions exercises. And so presumably the way we want to go about doing this, it looks like uh, our main function uh, just says, you know, calls another, another function call me. So um, well, it's not def, that's Python. And we'll say function call me. And uh, we're not actually gonna do anything within that. So that should um, just work. Cool. Uh, move on to functions two. So now our function takes an input, but um, we can't have uh, anonymous parameters. I think we need to give a, a type signature to or a type to each of the different inputs we have for our function. So um, we have i32. There, now, 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 now it works. Um, so. Yeah, we can't we can't sort of leave function parameters implicitly defined the way you would in like Python or JavaScript, which don't have types. You should explicitly define uh, all of your types uh, in Rust. Uh, so functions three. In this one, uh, it looks like the only thing we really have to do is uh, um, we have this call me function that which takes a number and we don't actually pass that here, so we'll just uh, fill that in. Say call me four. Uh, hopefully that'll just work. Cool. All right, two more to go. Let's go ahead and open up uh, functions four. See what's going on there. Um, so, oh yes, we need to have return types. Um, well, it's, you don't have to specify if it's void or if it's null. Essentially, unless we have in main, we don't have return type because we don't return anything. Um, but in this case, we can't just have this arrow and then not uh, return something. So in this case, we're going to want to uh, return uh, an integer. Since that seems to be, we take our price and we subtract. So that's easy enough. Um, it should leave us one more uh, exercise to do here. All right, so. No. Ah, yes. Yeah. So th this is a common error you'll probably make a lot when you're transitioning from something like C++ or something like Haskell um, to uh, to Rust. Is that when you th there are two different ways you can sort of return something. You can um, when you're at the final expression in your function, you just want to return that value. You can you you actually don't have a semicolon, um, so that should actually make this com um, compile. Although alternatively, I believe can also use the return keyword in conjunction with a semicolon. Yes, that also works. So either of those approaches um, is good for functions. So um, I think that's all uh, the exercise we'll go through uh, this time. So next up, we sort of have uh, this quiz where we, we'll uh, sort of maybe do some of these quizzes and do some of the more uh, advanced concepts. And then in the weeks to come, uh, I think I'm going to do some videos, um, just sort of seeing how we could uh, do a similar a program like this um, to teach people Haskell. I don't think it could work out um, the same way where um, you know the files don't compile. Um, maybe, maybe you could do that, but I think it would be easier to have things be sort of undefined and to sort of use testing um, to sort of reveal that hey, you, you know, your functions are still undefined. So um, that'll be something I'll be exploring later. Um, so thanks for tuning in this video, and I will see you next Monday.